So a couple months ago, I made a video about eight underrated TV shows you should watch. And since then, a lot of you guys have been asking me to do a similar list about movies this time. And you know what? Who am I to turn down my fellow space ninjas, huh? The holiday season is starting, it's snowing outside, Elon Musk is losing a bunch of money. I'm in a good mood, so for once, I'll do what you guys ask me. It took me a little while because I wanted to make sure to have great picks, but I've compiled you guys a list of 10 underrated movies I think you should watch. Some incredible hidden gems lurking below the surface waiting to be found. Maybe they're underrated because it's a specific medium or genre, maybe it just kind of flew under the radar for several reasons. But the point is, a lot of people don't even know these movies exist and that's really unfortunate, so I'm gonna try to show them off a bit. Now I know that different people enjoy different things, so I kept that in mind. These movies are all very different in terms of tone, genre, and subject matter, so I'm quite positive that anyone watching this video will be able to find at least one movie on the list that'll be for them. That said though, they're all really good, I promise, so even if a movie doesn't seem like something you'd usually watch, maybe give it a shot, you never know. Oh, and of course, I'm always looking for new movies to add to my watch list, so if you know some underrated movies you think people should watch, some other hidden gems lurking below the surface, please do not hesitate to pitch them in the comments down below, I would love to go through them. So we're gonna get into it, but first, I just wanna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor sir, Kamikoto. If there's one thing I enjoy doing, it's cooking. I don't always have time to do it, but when I do, oh boy, I am in it. I am so focused you could call me Gordon Ramsay. Hell, I'll start speaking with a British accent for no reason. And because in my head, and only in my head, I am a world-class chef when I'm cooking, I obviously have to be equipped with the best of the best. Enter Kamikoto knives. Now these knives are the real deal. They're made with high quality Japanese steel using traditional techniques and they're used all around the world by Michelin star chefs. Okay, they're legit. If you need a great set of knives for your cooking, I don't think it gets better than that. This is what you need. Each knife is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee. They also come in this cool, heavy duty ashwood box. And I mean, look at it. And honestly, all of that makes Kamikoto knives a great present for any friend, relative, or partner who is into cooking, especially with Christmas coming up. And you know what? You're in luck. Because Kamikoto is running a massive Black Friday sale right now, and they're also offering you guys an extra $50 off any purchase with discount code Friendly Space Ninja. So this is your occasion. If you also want to be a cool looking chef with a British accent, go to kamikoto.com slash Friendly Space Ninja. I'm kidding about the British accent. It doesn't come with the knives. But kamikoto.com slash Friendly Space Ninja. The link is in my description check them out. Thank you so much to Kamikoto for sponsoring this video and let's get back to our movie list. All right, we are locked and ready. Here are 10 underrated movies you should watch now. We're doing it top 10 style, starting with number 10, The Wolf of Snow Hollow. To kick off this list, we have an incredibly underrated movie from an incredibly underrated writer-director, Jim Cummings. My fiance introduced me to this guy. She's obsessed with him and she might leave me for him. I don't know, I'll keep you posted. And his work is is just fucking great. I'm pretty sure all of his movies are crowdfunded and made completely independently, and it's crazy to see how much talent goes into them. The Wolf of Snow Hollow tells the story of John Marshall, played by Jim Cummings himself, the deputy sheriff of the title small town Snow Hollow, who is struggling with anger management issues and alcoholism. He has a difficult relationship with his ex-wife and his daughter that he's clumsily trying to navigate, and he also has a tense relationship with his father, who is the sheriff of the town. So as you can imagine, John's life is complicated enough, but things quickly take an even darker turn for him when a series of unusually brutal murders begin to terrorize the town and rumors of a terrifying werewolf on a killing spree begin to spread. John is initially irritated by the stupid rumors, but as his investigation progresses, he starts to think they might not be entirely wrong. This movie 
is so fun. For one, Jim Cummings has a very specific sense of humor because yes, despite the premise I just gave you, you should know that The Wolf of Snow Hollow is a dark comedy and I think it works incredibly well with this movie. He has a knack for perfectly blending comedy and drama and he does it in a way that gives his movies a very distinct identity. The murder mystery tied with this cop who is just miserably failing at getting his life together makes for interesting and intriguing characters and the conflicts that emerge out of that are really compelling to watch. John Marshall is one of those characters that kind of suck as a person but you still want to see him succeed both in his mission to catch the murderer but also when it comes to his personal growth. He's a man who always tries to do the right thing but always ends up doing it the wrong way and he suffers the consequences for better or for worse. The film also nails its sense of atmosphere. The small and snowy town in the mountains is just very effective as a setting. It's creepy and unsettling. The narrative is so solid. It progresses in ways that feel completely different from other movies like that and it takes turns you just do not expect. Put your pants on! <laughs> Neighbor! Uh, sorry! <laughs> This movie also features the very last performance of Robert Forster, who you probably know from Mulholland Drive, Heroes, or more recently, the continuation of Twin Peaks. I believe he passed away from a brain tumor right after shooting The Wolf of Snow Hollow, and the movie came out after his passing, so it's really sad that he never got to see it. So yeah, The Wolf of Snow Hollow is a fantastic film. It's such a fun watch, I cannot recommend it enough. If you want a cozy movie night at home, whether it's by yourself, with friends or a partner whatever it is it's a great pick i promise you you're gonna have a good time okay next number nine Equilibrium. I don't think my list could feel complete without a good old dystopian future story. I am such a sucker for those, and this movie is partially the reason why, because I first saw it when I was a kid, even though I was way too young to watch it. Equilibrium is a dystopian sci-fi movie that takes place in the year 2072 in Libria. Libria is a totalitarian city-state established years prior by the survivors of World War III, and the people running it blame human emotion as the cause for that war. As a result, any activity or object that stimulates emotion is strictly forbidden to the population. Those in violation are labeled sense offenders and are sentenced to death immediately. The population is forced to take a daily injection of a drug called Prosium 2 that suppresses their emotions and they are all under the surveillance of the one they call father. The ruler of Libria who constantly addresses the nation with propaganda through giant video screens placed all around the city. Now, the highest rank of law enforcement in Libria are called clerics. They are deadly, merciless agents who track down sense offenders to execute them and destroy any illegal material related to emotion. So music, books, art, you name it. In the story, we follow John Preston played by Christian Bale. John is one of the highest ranking clerics in the city and when we meet him, he has recently become a single father of two after his wife was executed for having emotions. We get a peek at the cold life he lives, but everything takes a turn when, one day, John accidentally breaks his daily vial of prosium right before going on a mission and for the first time he begins to feel emotions and is overwhelmed by a deep feeling of guilt over the execution of his partner. And it's only then that John discovers an entire world he was not aware of and starts unraveling a deep conspiracy about Libria and its true purpose. Now, if you've been following, you probably noticed that Equilibrium is heavily, heavily inspired by George Orwell's iconic science fiction novel, 1984. And it doesn't try to be subtle about it, it's very obvious. Libria is a more peaceful version of 1984's Oceania. Father is pretty much an alternate version of Big Brother, the all-seeing entity of Oceania in 1984. And hell, just like in the book, the protagonist gets fucked by getting attached to a character named O'Brien. There's also a number of parallels with Fahrenheit 451, the novel by François Truffaut, but Equilibrium makes it more focused on on action. The clerics in the movie are trained in a fictional futuristic martial art called gun kata and you get a bunch of action sequences that put it in full display. It is peak 2002 campy action 
completely balls to the wall. It is so fun. <laughs> It's a movie that heavily banks on spectacle. It wants to be entertaining first and foremost, but it also refuses to be brainless. In other words, Equilibrium is just dumb fun, but with some interesting themes attached to it. Again, it is very much a product of the early 2000s, and I kinda love it for that. I don't think a movie like this could be made today. Despite all the spectacle on screen, the movie still makes you ask questions about the human nature. What are we without our bonds or our emotions? Is peace worth having is the price for it is to erase everything that makes us human. And most of all, if you cannot experience joy, sadness, love, anger, or any other emotion, are you even truly living? Sure, other movies have also explored those themes and probably did it better. Like it's not exactly reinventing the wheel or anything, but there is a charm to Equilibrium that makes it very unique as a film. And I have a very deep attachment to it. Like I said, I first saw this movie as a kid when it came out in 2002. I was like seven and it was one of my favorite movies and I used to watch it on repeat with my older brother all the time. So yeah, if you want a movie with Christian Bale doing gun karate and questioning his humanity for two hours, this one is for you. Equilibrium is super underrated. All right, let's move on. Number eight, Dope. Yeah, all right, let's, let's just jump to a completely different genre. Dope is the story of Malcolm, a high school student from a dangerous, crime-filled neighborhood of Inglewood, California. Malcolm is super intelligent. He's a straight-A student and a huge geek obsessed with comic books, video games, 90s hip-hop, and its entire culture and fashion. He's a good kid. He lives a mostly uneventful life with his two friends, Jib and Diggy, and they mostly try to stay away from trouble as Malcolm works works his ass off to achieve his ultimate goal of being admitted into Harvard. Unfortunately though, good old Malcolm starts developing a crush on a girl named Nakia, played by Zoe Kravitz. Nakia is the on and off girlfriend of another guy named Dom, played by ASAP Rocky, who is one of the neighborhood's biggest drug dealers. This little crush eventually leads Malcolm and his friends to a big party thrown by Dom, which ends up going south when it is crashed by a rival gang that starts a shootout. Malcolm manages to escape with the help of Dom and he thinks the nightmare is over, so he goes home. However, the nightmare is only beginning because the very next day, Malcolm realizes that Dom snuck drugs, a gun, and a burner phone into his backpack before getting him out. And now, a mysterious man is after him. This movie is a fucking blast. I know it doesn't sound like it with the premise I just gave you, but dope is hilarious. It is such a fun, charismatic movie filled with great performances and just impeccable direction. It looks so good. It was written and directed by Rick Famuyiwa, who more recently directed a few episodes of The Mandalorian, and fuck me, man, he just nailed this thing. It's kind of an insane ride, but the characters are all so cool and well-crafted, and despite the urgency of the plot, the movie often takes beats to showcase some amazing dialogue that just cracks me up. There's notably a scene that features a white guy trying to argue with the main characters that he should be able to say the n-word and while it drives a very specific point across it does it in such a hilarious way i had to replay that scene a couple times because i was just laughing too hard this shit is so funny bro you probably got like one of the photogenic brains or some shit huh <laughs> you mean photographic memory like what i'll just say i mean yeah you, you said it but yeah Dope is an amazing ride that is very unique, it works incredibly well as a comedy, it does incredibly well with the dramatic beats, and most of all, it is just an amazing coming of age story. I would say that the movie is a tad too long, but it manages to address a lot of serious topics without sucking the fun out of the movie, and without having it feel like they're shoving a message down your throat with zero subtlety. It is done with care, it is done with skill, and it is done with a point. If you haven't seen Dope, I cannot recommend it enough. You're gonna have so much fun. Okay, let's move on. Number seven, Perfect Blue. All right, if you know me, you know that I love me a dark psychological thriller, and this is one of my favorites. This movie is messed up 
I love it. Perfect Blue is the incredibly sinister story of Mima Kirigoe. Mima is a member of an extremely popular J-pop group named Cham. She's an idol, she's popular, people love her, she's killing it. But when the movie starts, the identity of pop idols in Japan is kind of falling out of style. So in order to salvage her career, Mima decides to leave her girls band and abandon her pop star status to become a full-time actress. She eventually gets a role in a soap opera opera that quickly reveals itself to be a bit of a risk for her career because it fundamentally goes against the clean-cut, family-friendly image she built for herself. However, she takes the role anyway, and that is when things start to get weird. <laughs> A bizarre stalker begins sending her threatening messages, she starts to see an alternate version of herself everywhere she goes, a version of herself that remained a J-pop idol. She also hears about a mysterious website called Mima's Room, and keep in mind this movie came out in 1997, it's not the same internet as today, and when she looks at it, she discovers an entire diary that recounts the events of her days in extreme detail. And by that I mean, some of the things described in this diary diary could not be known by anyone but her, which is terrifying because she didn't write it. Things keep escalating and Mima is becoming more and more unstable mentally, to the point where she struggles to even tell what is real around her and what is real about her, and this slow descent into madness takes an even darker turn when a series of murders starts to happen around her, and when the hunt for the killer starts, Mima is not entirely sure she's innocent. Perfect Blue was directed by the great Satoshi Kon, who also made the more famous Paprika, which is also really good, and it was produced by the famous animation studio Madhouse, which is notably also the studio behind the legendary Death Note and the remake of Hunter x Hunter. This movie is so good and so messed up. It is full of very difficult moments to watch. This is probably where I should give you a trigger warning for sexual assault, but it's also full of really well thought out commentary. Notably, when it comes to exposing the way young women often get taken advantage of when trying to make a name for themselves in the entertainment industry. And for better or for worse, it does a great job at showcasing that in a way that feels way too real. It's extremely dark and terrifying, and it's not afraid to go deep with its themes. You spend the whole movie watching this lovely and attaching young woman as she slowly loses her sanity. And it feels so incredibly unsettling because she just feels so real. She feels like a person. And it's just kind of heartbreaking to watch her go through that. This movie is creepy, it has some very well executed twists and an attention to detail that is just out of this world. I know a lot of people will shy away from a movie the second they see it's animated, and some will shy away from anime altogether, but trust me, if you like dark movies that really deconstruct characters and their psyche, you don't want to miss this one. It's only an hour and 21 minutes, it's super short, and as a sinister psychological thriller with horror elements, it is right up there with the likes of Gone Girl, Parasite, Black Swan, or even Get Out. If you are somebody that doesn't watch Japanese animation and you doubt the legitimacy of these stories, you should watch Perfect Blue. I promise you, it is the real deal, and you're not gonna see it coming. Let's move on. Number 6. Shiva Baby. Now, I gotta give full credit to my homie Amanda the Jedi on this one, because she's the reason why I know this movie even exists. This movie deserves way more attention, especially when you consider the fact that Emma Seligman, the writer and director of this movie, is only 27 years old, which means she made this movie when she was like 23 or 24. That is a crazy accomplishment, especially for a young woman in this industry. Female filmmakers really have to fight to get their projects made, but Emma Seligman absolutely nailed her debut, and I want to talk about it because I think more people should watch and support this movie. So Shiva Baby is the story of Danielle, a college senior who feels a bit lost and has no idea what to do with her life after college, which is particularly stressful for her because her Jewish family is putting a lot of pressure on her when it comes to building what they consider to be a respectable career. For now, 
though, Danielle is working as a babysitter. Or at least, that's what she tells her parents, because she's actually a sex worker with a sugar daddy named Max who seems to really like her. After a morning of doing the devil's tango with Max, shout out to Alex Myers, Danielle makes her way to a shiva, which is essentially a Jewish funeral. Somebody in the family that she never knew or cared about has died, and now she has to spend the entire day stuck in a house with her overly critical family and friends of the family who keep questioning her about her future, her ambitions, and her career. And just to make matters worse, Danielle's successful ex-girlfriend Maya is also there and she greatly adds to the pressure being put on Danielle because she loves to push her buttons out of spite and the whole thing feels incredibly claustrophobic. Oh, mama can't eat that. Why not? I'm vegetarian. You're killing me. I've told you it so many times. You have not eaten a single thing. All day. That's because we just got here. You look like Gwyneth Paltrow on food stamps. Oh but believe it or not, there is more. Things take an even darker turn because moments later, Max shows up at the funeral. Yes, you heard that right. Max, Danielle's sugar daddy, turns out to be a friend of the family and he knows Danielle's parents. And just because things can always get worse, Max is at the Shiva with his wife and his kid, both of which Danielle had no idea even existed. So for the entire movie, we follow Danielle as she desperately tries to keep her head above water while she is stuck in a house with her unbearably judgmental family, her ex-girlfriend who hates her guts, her sugar daddy, and his secret family she will probably be responsible for ruining. And this is the first thing that I find so incredibly impressive about Shiva Baby. It is a masterclass of tension building. This entire movie takes place inside of one house that is full of people and where nothing ever stops to take a breath. Danielle cannot catch a break and every time you think things cannot get worse, something comes along and proves you wrong immediately. The only way I have to accurately describe Shiva Baby is referring to it as a 77 minute panic attack. And Emma Seligman is so good at using tension that she even pulls off a couple of very effective jump scares. And this isn't even a horror movie. She makes the whole film feel so insanely claustrophobic, and not just through the setting, but also in the way she directs scenes. Emma uses a lot of close-ups and she refuses to cut to a wide shot, which just makes everything feel more intense and confined. You feel like you're choking, like some scenes will go on for a while as people talk to Danielle or about Danielle and you will feel the tension rising and rising and rising. The music gets more and more tense as well. It gets louder and louder and it won't let you breathe. Like honestly, despite being very funny because this movie has a lot of humor, it also has so much tension. It's quite impressive. Do you remember the song we used to sing? Of course. <laughs> Baby Shake. Baby Shake. <laughs> when she was Rose's age, we used to sing that baby shake song okay. whenever she cried. That's what we should have been doing with Rose. Let's make. And the thing is, Shiva Baby does not always give you the satisfaction of letting that tension drop like most movies would. Things just keep escalating and keep getting worse as the story goes on and you're on the edge of your seat the entire time because you know it's going to explode at some point. You can feel that Danielle is internally fighting every cell in her body to keep her composure. She's sweating, she's shaking. After a while, she's so stressed that she starts having trouble keeping track of her conversations. Like, it's very clear she's about to snap, but you just don't know when it's gonna happen. Emma Seligman literally weaponizes anxiety to keep the movie going. She uses it against the audience, and it works. It's like a car crash. You can't take your eyes off of it, no matter how horrible it gets. The more you see Danielle losing her shit, the more everyone around her seems to be against her, the more she starts getting confused with her own lies and losing track of her elaborate facade, the more on edge you get as an audience. And it's worth noting that Rachel Sennett is fucking unbelievable in the role of Danielle. Like, seriously, her performance is out of this world. She's so good. And Diana Agron, who you probably know from Glee or... <laughs> 
I am number four. She also has a role in it, and she absolutely nails it. Shiva Baby is also really short. It's like an hour and 15 minutes, but you will be on the edge of your seat the entire time. I promise. I fucking love this movie, and I know you will too. All right, next. Number five. Rafiki. This movie is definitely not as fun as some of the entries on this list, but it's an important movie. Let me explain. Rafiki is a heartbreaking yet beautiful Kenyan drama about Kenna and Ziki, the daughters of rival political figures in Nairobi who meet and unexpectedly fall in love in a country where homosexuality is extremely illegal. We follow the two young women as they attempt to explore their relationship away from the laser focus of the public eye constantly reminded of what could happen to them if they ever get caught. This movie is so full of emotions, it's incredible. It's a story of love, it's a story of oppression, it's a story of hope, it's a story of despair. It is just a powerful letter to a political and religious culture that actively rejects differences, and more specifically, the LGBTQ plus community. Even the title, Rafiki, makes a reference to that. If you don't know, Rafiki is not just the name of a funny mandrel in The Lion King, it also means friend in Swahili, the native language of Kenya, in reference to how Kenna and Ziki have to pretend to be friends to avoid getting in serious trouble for going on dates. The movie was written and directed by the fantastic Kenyan filmmaker Wanuri Kahyu, and she did a legendary job with it. Aside from the incredible storytelling, aside from her insane talent at capturing emotions in such a real way, she also nailed the aesthetics of the movie. This thing is fucking gorgeous. It's colorful, it's vibrant, it has so much personality, she uses colors in specific ways to drive certain sequences, and it's done so well that colors feel like characters in the movie. And clearly, she did something right because Rafiki became the very first Kenyan movie to ever premiere or even screen at the Cannes Film Festival. Wanuri was praised across the board for making a movie in Kenya that directly challenges the societal norms of the country. So much so that Rafiki was banned in Kenya. And fun fact, the movie was banned because after the production of the film wrapped, the classification board asked Wanuri to change the ending to make it more remorseful towards homosexuality in order to appease the country, but Wanuri refused and fought to keep the original ending in place, which then resulted in the movie being banned. I mean, that's how you know she made something that matters. This movie is so important and so real, and I think everybody should watch it. It's not a long movie, it's only an hour and 22 minutes, but the amount of powerful messages and emotions they managed to pack in there is seriously impressive. You will laugh, you will smile, you will cry, and most of all, you will become familiar with the gut-wrenching reality that too many people around the world have to face, every single day. If you haven't seen Rafiki, I highly recommend it. It is a fantastic movie and a truly poignant introduction to how strong African cinema can be. All right, moving on. Number four, The Invitation. Oh yeah, baby. We are talking horror mystery, a genre I particularly enjoy. I'm not gonna say too much about this one because it is a mystery and I don't wanna spoil anything, but this movie genuinely had me glued to my chair the whole time. The Invitation is a sinister story about a man named Will, who is invited by his ex-wife Eden to a dinner party she is hosting with her new husband. Will and Eden divorced after the accidental death of their son, and he also found a new partner named Kira, who is going with him to the dinner. As the little gathering begins, Will wanders through his old house and revisits memories of a life he has left behind. But soon, he makes a horrifying discovery that makes him question Eden's true motivations, and he realizes this dinner party is not really what it appears to be. I'm kinda late to this movie myself, because I saw it last year, but it came out in 2015, I think? But holy shit! I am so glad I watched it. The Invitation is 
incredible. It does such a great job at carrying its intrigue. Just like Shiva Baby, the entire movie takes place inside of one house, and it has such an amazing way of making it feel like a prison. The dialogue is super well handled, the performances are super strong, and oh my god, the ending. The ending is so good. Uh, but that's it. That's it. I'm not saying anything more. You need to go into this movie as blind as possible. I wish I could go into it more and give more details, but you're just gonna have to trust me on this one. The invitation is great, I promise you. Even if you're not into horror or thrillers or things like that, give it a chance. This movie is worth it, I swear. Let's move on. Number three. Sound of Metal. Rounding up the top three, we have another movie where everyone is miserable. But this one is really special. Sound of Metal is the story of Ruben, played by Riz Ahmed. Ruben is a recovering addict and a talented drummer who forms a heavy metal duo named Black Gammon with his girlfriend Lou, who is played by Olivia Cook, whom most people now know as Allison Hightower in House of the Dragon. Ruben and Lou live together in an RV as they tour the US to do shows. They're in love and living every single day for their undying passion, but their life is brutally put on pause when Ruben begins to rapidly lose his hearing. A doctor tells him that most of his hearing is gone and he should immediately stop his tour. But Ruben doesn't listen and continues playing shows until Lou finally gets too worried about him and forces him to stop. Worried about Ruben's well-being and sobriety, Lou contacts his sponsor who sends them to an isolated shelter for deaf recovering addicts. From there, Ruben has to learn to accept his new reality and deal with the mental repercussions that come with it. This movie is beautiful and just so human. And while it deals with serious topics and has a fair share of emotionally charged moments, it doesn't over-dramatize things. Everything about it feels very natural, very organic. Following a character like Ruben is seriously interesting as an audience because while he's not a bad person, he is hella flawed. There is a lot of bottled up anger in this character and he has no idea how to deal with it or how to navigate his situation. And without the movie telling you, you can just tell that he never really made himself a priority in his life. Hell, in this movie, he reluctantly agrees to take care of himself, and he does it only because he doesn't want his girlfriend to leave him. It's only as the story goes that he learns to take care of himself for himself, and even then, he has a difficult time letting go of other motivations that are linked to external factors. But you're rooting for him, you want him to figure things out, because Ruben is just a guy. He doesn't feel like a movie character. He feels like a real person with qualities and flaws. And on a human level, it's just difficult to watch somebody go through something that troubling. And it's all helped by the fact that Riz Ahmed in this role delivers what is probably the best performance of his entire career. I barely have the words to describe how incredible he is as Ruben. It's shocking. Sound of Metal is a masterpiece. I cannot recommend it enough. It's very raw and to the point. It really has something to say and honestly, it is quite rare to see an entire film made around the deaf community and putting so much effort in crafting great characters into it. I don't know, I, I have an infinite amount of respect for this movie and I hope you love it just as much as I did. Okay, next, number two. Heart Attack, also known as Freelance. Heart Attack is an incredibly powerful movie from Thailand about a man named Yoon. Yoon is one of the top graphic designers in the country. He's a freelancer and an absolute workaholic. But when I say he's a workaholic, I mean he's a workaholic. Yoon goes several days in a row without sleeping to avoid losing a single minute of work for clients. He wants to dominate a highly competitive industry, so he overworks himself to an extreme in order to make as much time as he possibly can. He basically forces his body to stay awake by drinking coffee mixed with Red Bull, and he barely interacts with anyone. When we meet him, Yoon is pushing himself to finish an excessively demanding job for a magazine, and he has not 
slept a single second in over five days days and his body is starting to shut down some strange spots begin to appear all over his body and he is forced to consult a doctor to be examined and that's when he meets dr im a junior physician who is appointed to him as he tries to navigate this new situation yoon unexpectedly starts to develop feelings for his new doctor heart attack is quite a heartfelt movie i mean no pun intended. And it's very unique in how it's executed. I really like the way it bends genres, like it perfectly walks the line between lighthearted comedy and heavy drama. The characters are all very interesting. I love the way it addresses the topic of workaholism and the idea of attempting to master the highly coveted work-life balance. The movie is incredibly well directed, the performances are all really solid, and also, fun fact, in the movie, Yoon's character works with a producer named Named Jay, and she is played by one of my best friends, Violette Wattier. And I'm not even being biased here, she's incredible in her role. I mean, she was praised all around the world for it, and I'm pretty sure she won the highest award an actor can receive in Thailand, so don't even take my word for it. I'll take your word for it. What does this mean? Heart Attack is a movie that I didn't really expect would hit me so hard emotionally. It's heartwarming and beautiful, the relationships between the characters feel so genuine, the dialogue is just masterful, and honestly, it will restore your faith in humanity a little bit. And I'll just say, for this type of movie, I found the ending and the overall outcome of the story to be quite unusual, and I really applaud that. So yeah, Heart Attack is incredibly underrated because not a lot of movies from Thailand managed to break through the mainstream, but again, I cannot recommend it enough. All right, before we get to number one, I just want to give a few honorable mentions. Movies that didn't quite make the list, but it kind of hurt me to let them go, so I'm going to include them here, rapid fire. I think all of these movies are amazing and you should watch them. Bergman Island is a gorgeous indie film about a couple that retreats to an island to write their next movies, but things take a very strange turn. Ingrid Goes West is an incredibly weird ride with Aubrey Plaza and Elizabeth Olsen about a mentally unstable stable woman who goes on a trip to stalk her favorite influencer. Thunder Road is another movie from Jim Cummings about a cop whose life fucking sucks. 310 to Yuma is probably the most underrated western ever made about a rancher who goes on a mission to bring a notorious outlaw to justice. And of course, Ready or Not, a messed up horror movie about a young woman who meets her fiance's family for the first time and that shit does not go well. Put all of these in your watch list, they're all incredible. All right, and now to finish this off, let's move on to number one. The Nice Guys. Okay, I have been waiting to talk about this movie for a while now, so listen up. The Nice Guys is one of my favorite movies of the last 10 years, and I think it is an absolute crime that a lot of people have not seen it. It's not as overlooked as other movies on this list, I think it has started to get a bit more recognition in the last couple of years, but it is seriously underrated. So, okay, let me give you a quick breakdown. The Nice Guys takes place in 1970. 70s Los Angeles and tells the story of two private investigators played by Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe who kind of hate each other but find themselves in a situation where they are forced to reluctantly work together to find a missing young girl after the mysterious death of a porn star starts unraveling a strange conspiracy. Mr. March, we're gonna play a game. It's called Shut Up Unless You're Me. I love that game. The buddy cop action comedy genre was really popular in the 70s and the 80s, and I don't think a modern movie has ever done it justice better than this one. The Nice Guys is genuinely some of the most fun I've had watching movies in a very long time. It is such a blast. The chemistry between Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe is just out of this world. They're both so good and their banter is so fluid and charismatic. I know a lot of people like to say that Ryan Gosling only knows how to play stoic characters, which probably tells me you haven't seen a lot of his movies, but whatever. And if you are a person who thinks that, I highly advise you to watch this movie. You're going to 
eat your words. Did you cut yourself? I'm dealing with an injury. All right, look, when you're talking to your doctor, just tell him. No! No! Deep breath. No! Russell Crowe plays a roughed up PI named Healy who is struggling with elements of his past and he just has so little patience for the sheer laziness of Ryan Gosling's character named March. And March is a down on his luck alcoholic who never got over the death of his wife and let's just say he is not the most honest of PI. The dynamic between these two is very much what makes this movie work better than almost any other in the genre. And every single second they get to interact on screen is gold. All of the characters on screen are awesome. Notably, Ryan Gosling's character has a daughter who really steals the show in several moments. How much you got? 30 bucks. 30 bucks. Apple pie. Is she a big girl? She's tall. All right. Super but annoying. Apple pie. She's always mean to me. Just eat That's good. This conversation no is over. This movie has so many moments that had me rolling on the floor with laughter. The comedy is just elite. But it works incredibly well because it's all put in the middle of a genuinely compelling mystery. The story is really interesting and you really want to know where it goes. It has some really well executed twists and despite the hilarious comedy, some sequences will genuinely leave you on the edge of your seat. It's really unfortunate that this movie disappointed the studio at the box office. It really underperformed and as a result, we never got the sequel they wanted to make. And it's a shame because this is genuinely one of the best movies of the last few years. I've seen it like six or six seven times and it never stops making me laugh. The cast is incredible, Margaret Qualley specifically fucking kills it in this role, and pretty much everyone is acting their asses off in it. I could literally talk about this movie for hours, but I really have to stop myself from saying too much. You get the gist though, The Nice Guys is a 10 out of 10 comedy with fucking legendary characters attempting to solve a very, very well crafted mystery. I swear, this this is the perfect movie for a fun movie night at home by yourself or with other people. It doesn't matter. I've done both and it's a blast every fucking time. Also, fun fact, Robert Downey Jr. has a cameo in this movie, but he's really hard to find. Like he's very well hidden on purpose. So keep an eye out for that when you watch it. But anyways, to conclude, The Nice Guys is one of my favorite movies and I am very, very excited for more people to see it. I hope you like it as much as me and my friends did. How stupid do you think I am? Ever since your little visit the other day, this little baby's gonna stay right here. Well, there you have it, friends. 10 underrated movies I think you should watch. Some of those were on my watch list for like a couple years. And when I eventually got to watch them, I was like, damn. That was that was really good. Have you seen any of them? Is there one that sounded particularly intriguing to you? Whatever your thoughts are, leave them in the comments down below. And once again, please leave me some recommendations of your own in the comment section. There are so many incredible movies that go unnoticed and I'm always looking for some new ones. I watch a bit of everything, so no matter the vibe, no matter the genre, shoot me your best picks in the comments. I'm gonna have an absolute blast going through them. Thank you so much for watching. I love making these videos. Videos, it's quite different for me. Um, I have my little idea of what the next ones are gonna be and of course some more good old reviews and video essays are on the way so I'll see you guys really soon. Ruby, smile.